Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm Erica Allen. I'm one of the pastors here at Horizon Church. We're going to continue our series this morning, Rattle, um, as God brings new things to life. Um, there is this question that you ask when we start talking about dry bones and new things coming to life, and that is the fact that that means that something in our lives has died, right? Whether it be a dream, a friend, a person, a significant other. You can't talk about new life without talking about why there needs to be new life, right? So there's this universal question that we all ask, no matter what we believe about Jesus or what we don't believe about Jesus. Everyone has asked this question at some point in time in their life. They've asked, why does a good God let bad things happen? So we don't have to sing rattle, right, if no dry bones have been in a valley. We don't have to sing rattle if there's not been a person who died before they were walking again. Why does a good God let bad things happen? Your level of faith in asking that question can be strong or it can be at the point where this question might literally break what it is I believe about God. You may be on that spectrum today. I have answered this question and I am convinced that God is with me even when things are, don't look like I want them to or expect them to, when there is death and grief all around me. I choose to still believe in a good God. And some of you may be at a point in this question, why does a good God let bad things happen? Some of you may be asking this question this morning at the end of your rope. Because here's the deal. You also don't ask this question logically, right? This question is so wound up in emotions, right, that we can't get to what we're actually asking. And I'm not going to get there today. I'm the most emotional person I know. So that's how I ask this question, right? Chris, do not laugh back there. <laughs> you were the first person to laugh. I heard it. Um, <laughs> but we ask this question with a great bit of emotion, right, because it's attached to something in our lives, right? We ask this question because it is attached to something emotional in our lives. And so approaching this question theologically, logically, is not even an option for most of us. We automatically come at this question with a great deal of emotional pain, sometimes some shame. There's always something emotional attached to it. And I'll be really honest with y'all, I asked this question this very week. A dear friend of mine, who has literally changed the world. She sold everything she had and moved to South Africa a few years ago to teach in a university there and empower women to have access to education. She's an incredible woman. She moved back here to be a pastor of amazing churches. She does incredible things. And she let me know this week about a cancer diagnosis that she has. And my heart was broken. I asked this question this week. I asked this question over the last two years as our world has lost thing after thing after thing in the face of a worldwide pandemic. Why does a good God let bad things happen? I've asked this question about things I faced in my own life and Chris and I were trying to start a family when our own dreams died and were dry bones down in a valley. I've asked this question in my own life. Why does a good God let bad things happen? And this week, as I asked that question, I also, months ago, had picked out this, a certain story that we're going to read today that absolutely changed my life this week and how I answer this question. And I'm so excited to share it with you all. But before I do that, the story is found in the Gospel of John. Gospel means good news, and John was a disciple of Jesus. He followed him everywhere he went. He was one of his best friends, closest followers. His name was John. John wrote this Gospel, this account of what he experienced walking alongside of Jesus, watching him heal the sick, watching him heal people who were hurting with pain and shame, watching Jesus change the world, John writes us this account, but he doesn't write it the day after Jesus dies and rises again. John writes it 90 years after that. 
he, or he was probably about 90 years old when he wrote that. I don't know about y'all, but the older I get, the more I realize that I, I hope this isn't the case for me. I hope there's a lot more of my life still ahead of me. But the older we get, we start to realize there's less life ahead of us sometimes than there has been behind us. And John is at this point. He's at the end of his life, and he has walked alongside God who took on a human body, who lived like me and you, who had eyes and bones and flesh and skin and a heart that loved his friends. He walked alongside this God who took on a human body, just like all of us who's, who's pain, who felt pain in his body and in his heart. He walked alongside this God, and it changed everything. And he's nearing the end of his life, and he sits down and he writes a letter to the world. A world that just like us is asking question, this question, why does a good God allow bad things to happen? People who are emotionally exhausted, who are grieving and drained and tired, people who turn on their news and hear about supply chains gonna, is going to ruin Christmas. That kind of world is who John writes this letter to. And so he doesn't sit down and write this letter like, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and this is exactly what Jesus said because he doesn't have time in his life to write down every single thing Jesus said and every single thing that Jesus did. But he does have time to make sure every single one of us who are at the end of our rope and don't want to keep going and don't want to live for this purpose that God has given us through Jesus Christ, he writes to us and he says, hang on, hang on. Because I walked beside a God who took on human flesh, who lived in a human body and who had the option to pick up an evil terminating gun and just boom, 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 pow it all out and completely change the world. But he did something I could never have imagined or dreamed of and I want to tell you about it. Instead of taking that and just destroying evil with evil and violence, this is what this God did who took on a human, on a human body. He loved. He loved in the face of evil and brokenness, and sickness, and pain, and emotional exhaustion, and grief in the face of tragedy, and pain, and shame, and things we can't even hardly explain with our world words. In the face of all of that, Jesus loved. He loved us. He loved John even with the bad and evil and messed up things he did in his life. He loved these leaders in the synagogue who resisted change in the new day with everything they had. He loved a woman at the well who was ashamed of five husbands and a life of just pain and tragedy that, that surrounded her. He loved. On the cross, he looked at all of us that he loved, and he went and he did it anyway because he found a new way to deal with this question of evil, he loved. He loved. And John says, I'm at the end of my life and I can't explain it all. I don't know why he did this. I can't tell you everything. I can't write you a dissertation about it, but I can tell you what I saw and what I witnessed as I walked beside the God who loved in the face of evil. For the God who so loved the world that he gave his son, not just on a cross, but he gave his son to sit with us in the deepest moments of pain and tragedy that we experience in our lives. He sat with us in the middle of an oppressive and terrible government. He sat with us in the middle of religious leaders who refused to change or do anything new or different. This God loved, and it changed everything. So I may not answer your question today, but I will tell you in the face of evil, in the face of tragedy and pain and sickness, John said it, it, it was something like I never experienced or imagined before, but, but God's love coexisted alongside of it and somehow rooted it out in the power of love and changed everything. And he wants to tell us about it. So he tells us about it. John tells us about it in this very specific way. He tells us about signs. We would call them miracles today. But these aren't miracles because miracles are these happen chance, one moment things where we're like, oh, God probably did this. But this isn't miracles because 
John doesn't want us in love with a miracle worker. God wants us in love with Jesus, whose miracle point to God, who is and has done something new in this world and wants us to be a part of a purpose much bigger than we could ever dream or imagine that is creating a new day in the midst of dry bones and dead dreams. John wants to put a sign in the ground in the acts of Jesus that point us to the God who's doing something new and amazing. And so he does that. The first story he tells us about, the first sign that John puts in the ground is when Jesus meets a, meets a family at a wedding. He's at this wedding party, and his mom comes up to him, and he says, Jesus, she says, Jesus, they've run out of wine, and this family is about to be embarrassed in front of the whole world. They've invited all their friends, and they have nothing but water to serve. And Jesus takes water, and he turns it in to wine because it's a sign that points us to God who says you can, you can live over there in the corner. You can be embarrassed and, and shamed and pained about everything happening in your life. You can do that. But there's a new God. There's a new way of doing things in town. There's a new way of looking at things. Here's a sign. I'm going to turn this water into wine. There's enough. There's enough for everybody, and it's time that your shame and pain doesn't run the day, but that in the face of knowing that we're not enough, we celebrate God's grace and God's goodness in the middle of it, and we party. That's the kind of God I want to follow. Amen? A God who points signs to a bigger purpose going on in the world. And so this other thing is happening as Jesus does these signs. He's going back and forth between Jerusalem and Judea and, he, and Galilee. Galilee is full of people who like him and cheering him on and championing him just like us, right? Y'all come here to Horizon and you're championed and you're cheered on and you say, I tell you, God has a purpose for you and it's different than what the world's going to tell you, right? And then we go back out into the world. So we go back and forth, back and forth, and we go back out into the world that hasn't accepted or believed or fully embraced this new way of doing things and, and, and there's conflict in that right work looks a little funny or I have to make sense of a good God in a world filled with tragedy and pain and hard things right this is what this is exactly what Jesus does he goes to Galilee he hangs out with his friends and his family who love him and support him and then he goes back to Jerusalem and he starts talking to these people and he's like there's new things there's new ways of doing things he turns fish and loaves just a couple of them into feeding 5,000 people. He's going back and forth, back and forth, trying to change things. He realizes, I have to spend time with people who love me, who cheer me on and who champion me, and then I have to go back to Jerusalem and, and work on this. So in, in John chapter 10, verse 38, this has gone on. He's told these four or five stories. He's showed sign after sign after sign of Jesus pointing us to this bigger glory and purpose of God. And these these. These religious leaders look at Jesus in the temple. He's in the temple t teaching his heart out, saying, I've, I, I'm not just teaching you, I'm showing you. And these religious leaders look at him and they say, Jesus, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? Y'all want to know who's asked that question? This religious leader. How long are you going to keep me in suspense before you show me what you're actually going to do, God? They ask him, how long will you keep us in suspense if you are the Messiah Tell us plainly. If you're the promised one who's actually going to change and do something different, tell us plainly. And y'all can go home and read this when you get home, but it, Jesus, Jesus says, I have told you. I have told you I'm the Messiah, and I've not just told you, but I've showed you. I've walked on water. I've calmed storms. I feel people who are blind. I have showed you. You've chosen not to believe. And Jesus could have said that to me this week. I have shown you I'm doing something new, and I can't help it if you choose not to believe. I am doing something new. Do you believe? John writes this story down, and he's like, I remember Jesus answering their question, saying, I've not just told you, I've showed you. I thought this week about the people in this room who don't just tell people about Jesus' love, but who's rolled up their sleeves and showed them. A band who shows up here in, early on Sunday morning to help you encounter God's grace and love. People who go to Gandhi Civic Center, share Monty to tutor. People who've rolled up their sleeves and said, I'm not just going to tell you about a God who's rooting out evil and bad things with love. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. And in the middle of teaching these religious leaders, there's something new on the way. This is what John, say, John says happened. A man, in John chapter 11, verse 1, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, this village of Mary and her sister Martha. So Bethany is about a day and a half walk from where Jesus is staying right now. 
The sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Could you imagine being so close to Jesus that they don't say Lazarus is sick, they say the one you love is sick. This is a man whose house Jesus has sat in and he's been fed, he's been loved, he's been championed, he's been supported by him. The one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said this, something that literally made me like sick on my stomach this week. He said, this sickness will not end in death. I liked that part. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. This sickness is for God's glory? No, thank you. No, thank you. I don't understand how sickness and God's glory and God's love, I don't know how this can all interact. No, thank you. And I almost shut my Bible, and I'm not kidding you, I almost called Abby and Chris and said, we're going in a different direction this morning. I almost called him, but I read on, and I want, I want you to hear, because I think, I think John knew that we would all want to be about ready to close this up. If, if, if sickness and pain and brokenness can somehow show God's glory anyway, like what, how, what does this mean? And it says, now Jesus loved. Don't forget that Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. Don't forget that while we're talking about this, John says. So when he heard, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. He must have not been too worried about him, right? He stayed where he was for two more days because Bethany's still another day and a half walk away. So he stayed there for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. That's where Jerusalem is. Let's go back to Jerusalem. And remember what always happens in Jerusalem. He's always arguing or getting into some fight or experiencing some kind of conflict. People don't like him back in Jerusalem. So his disciples look at him and they say, um, but Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you want to go back there? Like, maybe we're not real interested in going back to Judea. We don't trust those religious leaders' aim, and if they miss you, they're going to hit us, so we're not real interested about going back to a place where they stoned you. Anybody said that before? I'm not real interested in following you there, Jesus. Do you know what kind of stone-throwing bullies I might experience there? So they're like, ah, we're not real interested in going. And Jesus answer, answers back to them and says, like, they're like, we don't want to go back there. We're scared they're going to stone you to death. And Jesus says, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Way to dodge the question, Jesus. <laughs> like, what are you talking about there, uh, Jesus? And there are 12 hours of daylight, darkness, stumbling. What are you talking about, Jesus? And I read this through a couple times, and I underlined this with my purple marker. Are there not 12 hours of daylight? We can joke around about fear holding us back, about worried about chasing God's purpose because somebody might throw a stone or an insult or something at us. We might not win the day. We can sit back and not do what God has asked us to do in the face of that. Or we can seize the opportunity. There are 12 hours of daylight. There are 12 hours for us to chase God's purpose in our lives. Are you going to let fear hold you back? And you're like, Erica, what does this have to do with evil and sickness and all this stuff coexisting with God? Because all of these things in our lives start to add up to make this question so emotional and powerful that it begins to eat at our faith. And it's because there are moments along the road that we say, no, Jesus, we're not real interested in going there because somebody might throw a stone at us. And Jesus reminds us, he puts a sign in the ground, there are 12 hours of daylight. There are 12 hours for you to chase God's purpose for your life. Quit letting fear hold you back, he says to his disciples. And after that, he said this. He went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. And the disciples have heard him say, we have 12 hours to do what it is God wants us to do. But his disciples replied with some medical advice, like Jesus wasn't the great physician and healer. They answer back to him, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. <laughs> just let him sleep. We can still stay here. He can just sleep it off, drink some water. It'll be fine. Jesus 
had been speaking of Lazarus' death, though, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So your medical advice isn't helpful, disciples. We still got to go back to Lazarus. And so he looked at him plainly, right in the face, and he said to him, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And this one literally stopped me in my tracks this week because I heard Lazarus is dead. There are some things that have died in this season of my life. Dreams, opportunities, expectations, ceremonies and rituals, birthday parties and showers. Those things are dead. But listen to this. I heard these words today. And for your sake, Erica, I'm glad I wasn't there, Jesus says, so that you may believe. And for your sake, Zach, for your sake, Chris, for your sake, Kara, for your sake, Eric, I am glad I wasn't there, Jesus says, so that you may believe. For your sake, Gretchen, Dave, Jacob, Carol, I am glad I wasn't there, Jesus says, because now you can believe. And then Thomas, who's always counted on to ruin the strong and powerful moment, says to the rest of his disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. Jesus is going to die on the way there. Lazarus is dead. We might as well all die. Thank you, Thomas, for ruining the moment. Who wants to be Didymus? Thomas or among us here this morning. He just like ruins the powerful moment. <laughs> so I love this though, because so often we take this life of following Jesus like it's so serious. And John even remembers there were moments of following Jesus where we just have to laugh at how silly we were and how we missed it and how we wanted our own things to be accomplished at the silly, crazy, laughable things we did among the moment. Because there are moments that these things are so emotionally heavy and hard that we miss what God is doing because we take everything a little too serious. And Thomas, as silly as he was, reminded us in that moment, yes, it's powerful to believe in Jesus, but it's also fun. It's also fun. This is a pattern in Jesus' life, right? Party. Now listen to this. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Jacob's going to come up. In a tomb, you're given some grave clothes. He's going he's gonna to come and... Yes, that Jacob. Uh, he's going to give you some grave clothes. And as we keep reading this, I want you to take the pen that you got on the way in here. And on these grave clothes, I want you to write something that has died. When he gets there for four days, Lazarus was dead. All the rituals have been taken care of. He's been wrapped in a linen cloth. Write on it something in your life that, has, that, that is, is gone and dead, that you've buried. Go ahead and write it on here with the pen that you've been given. As we keep on going, yeah, when you get these, um, you can just write on it. We're just going to keep on going. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to, Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. So it's not just Martha and Mary there. There's a ton of people there mourning the loss of Lazarus. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. So Jesus, Martha hears that Jesus is coming. So she runs out there and she says to Jesus, she looks him in his face, as y'all hold these grave clothes in your hand. He, said, he looks at him and says this to, er, to his, Jesus' face. If you had been here, Jesus, my brother would not have died. What is it that you want to write on those grave clothes? If you would have done what you were supposed to, God, this wouldn't be dead. Martha, who had extreme faith and love for Jesus, looks him in the face and says, if you would have been here, this would not have happened. I want you to hear this. Hear me clearly. Your faith still allows you to look in the face of God and say, if this would have looked like this, I wouldn't be experiencing this. Write it on that sheet right now. Write it on there. If you would have been here, Jesus, my brother would not have died. 
but like so many of us, she's clinging on by a thread to what little bit of faith she has in God. And she says, but I know that even now, God will give us whatever it is we ask. I'm going to hold on to this tiny thread of my faith that God will do whatever it is I ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha looks at him and says, Jesus, I went to synagogue. I know the Sunday school answer to your question, right? I know, I hear you. Your brother will rise again. I know that. I've read that. I've heard that's what God does. But, but Jesus said to her, I, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. Yes, Lord, she replies, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's come into the world. And then she goes and gets her sister Martha, and there's a similar exchange and similar words and similar conversation. Similar conversation. And then when, and then Jesus went in and, she, and he saw him. She Jesus went in, she saw, he saw Mary too, she fell at his feet, and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So it's this very similar, very similar um, interaction with the other sister. So everybody's mad at Jesus, right? And when Jesus saw her weeping, when Jesus saw Mary and Martha weeping, and the Jews, his best friends who had come along with them also weeping, when he saw everybody crying and grieving, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he looked at him and he said, where have you laid him? Jesus said, I can't bear to see everyone in this kind of pain and trouble. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. I don't know who broke the Bible down into all these verses and chapters, but Jesus wept is the shortest verse, and I'm so glad they made it its own because I think it's a powerful moment. Jesus sees what it is on those grave cloths. He knows what it is that's broken our hearts. He knows what it is that has Mary and Martha absolutely and totally devastated and grieving in their lives. He knows why there's a bunch of friends around the grave of this man who's championed and supported them. He is hurt too. And we have two choices moving on in life. We can just move on carrying this grief with us, behind us, or we can stop right here where we are and we can grieve. We can acknowledge the pain that we have experienced in our life. We can write it down and we can know that Jesus sees this. He wept and he broke down with them. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Grief and pain, heartbreak, that doesn't mean you're weak. It means you love, and it's the most powerful thing in the world. John said this. It changes everything. But some of them felt like Mary, and they said, could he not? If he could open the eyes of a blind man, he could have saved this man from dying. And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, Jesus said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. It's going to be stinky in there, for he has been in there for four days. I don't think it's a good idea to roll that stone away. How many of us have said that about the pain and the grief that God has asked us to actually look at and deal with in our lives? You don't understand how stinky and messy it is. Let's just leave that stone in place. Let's just bury that a little deeper in our heart and soul. But Lord, it's stinky and it's messy in there, for it's been in there for days. I've not dealt with or thought about that for years. And Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you'd heard me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here and sitting here at Horizon thousands of years later, that they may believe that you sent me and I'm going to change everything. This is why God did this through Jesus. And when he'd said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus! Come out. 
the dead man came out. His hands and his feet were wrapped in the strips of linen and there was a cloth across his face. And Jesus said to him, throw off the grave clothes and let them go. Throw them right now. Throw off the grave clothes and let them go. Throw off the grave clothes and let them go. Throw off the grave clothes and let them go. There is a purpose that God has for you to join in with Him. Loving this world in the face and in the midst of evil and brokenness and pain and tragedy. And we cannot do that if we are tied to grief and pain that we refuse to give to God to let Him make it new. Lazarus was not the same man. He had experienced death and trauma and pain. He would never be the same again. But he threw off those grave clothes because he knew that they would weigh him down if he didn't let Jesus deal with them. What is it in your life right now that you need to take those grave clothes and throw them to Jesus? Throw them off and be freed up to live in to the purpose God has given you to love a world that is emotionally exhausted, that is grieving and fragile. And tell them, for our sake, Jesus is doing a new thing. And here's a sign, and here's a sign, and here's a sign. Be like John. And tell a world desperate for it that in a world where we could just go around and handle evil with our little exterminator evil guns, we choose to live by a different way. We choose to watch God's love root out this evil and pain and grief and shame and make something new. Roll the tomb away. That is is what everybody in here has been called to do. What is it that's held you back? Let it go. Let it go. There's a world out there ready for you to live into the purpose God has had for you. Let it go. Let it go. On the night before Jesus gave himself up for us, these same disciples who sat there in that room, who stood beside that grave, they took bread... And they gave thanks to God for the bread. And then Jesus shared this bread with them. And he said, this is the bread. This is the bread of life. Take, eat, and know that I'm about to give myself up for you on the cross and raise again so that you may be whole. And then when the supper was over, he took wine. We'll, we're going to take juice this morning. He gave thanks to God for that, for that juice. He shared it with his disciples and he said, there's a new promise. There's a world that's going to convince you that shame and pain and everything else is going to hold you back. There's a world like that, but there's a new promise. I'm going to defeat every single bit of that. I've showed you sign after sign after sign after sign of me doing that. And here's the final sign. This cross and the resurrection is going to be the final sign that those things no longer have power over your lives. This Drink it right now. This is the blood of Jesus given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins that we may be set free for the purpose God has for us. And then Jesus says, the most powerful thing you can do in my name is to love one another. Throw off those grave clothes and love somebody well this week. Let's shine some light and ignite some change.